business cards if anyone wants them. Yeah, um, so good afternoon and uh, you're welcome to the first of four sessions that we're doing with Traverse. I'm not going to take um, much time at all up here because uh, we've got three great speakers and then we want to do a panel. So just want to run through quickly who's speaking. We have Kevin from Flagship Consulting who are also sponsoring this session. So a big thank you to them. And then um, Tawana from various companies. Uh, she's got about six, so I don't know which one I'm meant to use today. Um, who's going to be talking about Facebook Live um, and Periscope. And then we'll have Neve Shields from Eat Like, Eat like a Girl, who's going to be speaking about Snapchat. Um, after this is all done, we will have about 15 minutes, we hope, for a, uh, a panel. We can take audience, um, audience questions, um, but you can also, of course, use the app, as they mentioned. And we're going to try and get through as many of those as we can. I know if any of you have been to our panels before, we do try and move them along as fast as possible, at least when Alistair McKenzie's not hosting them. Um, yeah, so I think we should uh, we'll get started now. So first, um, if we could welcome Kevin from Flagship. Thanks. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. And thank you com for coming to our session on mobile and live social media. Um, my name is Kevin Mullaney. I'm from Flagship Consulting, which we should be able to go forward on. I'll go to the next slide. Anyway, before I hand you over to our other expert panelists, um, what I'm going to be taking the next 10 minutes to discuss is obviously mobile, social, and video aren't anything new, but really how they're actually coming together now in a very powerful way, and how video is actually going to be an incredibly important tool in the travel marketers' toolkit uh, in the near future. Ah, there we go. Um, and as I said, I'm Kevin. I'm from Flagship Consulting. We are an integrated communications and digital marketing consultancy with uh, specialism in uh, travel PR. Um, and actually, you may find on your seats, if you haven't already, or you can actually find them over there, we are giving away a nice bottle of bubbly today, if you could actually give us your thoughts on what challenges travel marketers are facing. Uh, now, in my day-to-day -day at Flagship, I, um, I work actually across uh, a number of, uh, across the entire agency, across the uh, corporate space, with clients like EY and AIG. But it's actually, uh, travel is a particular interest of mine because it really does um, deal with a number of the disciplines that I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, from customer experience, audience mapping, uh, search, social media, paid promotion, uh, and digital PR. Um, so I do have the pleasure of working with a number of great travel brands, um, you know, such as ABTA, Silver Rail Technology, Norwegian Cruise Line, White Link Ferries, and many other on a day-to-day. -day. Uh, and I'll just talk you through really what we're actually advising our clients, particularly uh, when it comes to video. So really, we're going to talk about mobile first, and you've probably heard a lot about it in the last few years, but 2015 really was a momentous year uh, and is signaling a big shift in the change in customer behavior. Um, last year, more people actually were spending time on their mobile devices than they were on their desktops. And this change in behavior has meant that people actually um, desire and require different, f different types of content as they move from the big to the small screen. And that being the case, actually, working on mobiles, people are actually more and more uh, wanting to actually see video content. Millennials in particular are actually four times more likely to look at a video than they are to read about a product. Uh, and in the travel marketing space, actually, recent, uh, recent research from Google suggests that this trend is even more acute with about 87% of the digital moments that happen online are happening on a mobile device. And so if travel is mobile, then mobile is actually inherently social. If you think about what you're doing when you're on your mobile phone, you know, when you're going and browsing online, going about, about your daily business, you're actually you know, intrinsically linked to social. You're getting notifications from friends, um, you're replying on Messenger, and as you go to comparison sites, as you're planning your trips and your journeys, ultimately social is the one sort of constant that you keep coming back to and are influenced throughout, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Now, I say this with a great deal of recent experience, having just come back from uh, my honeymoon in the Seychelles, and what you'll see through every part of the sort of path to purchase is that you will actually be looking for you know, inspiration from brands, but you'll also be getting recommendations, you'll be trying to find out, as I did, for example, that you don't want to go to the Maldives in May, it's actually a little bit better to go closer to the equator, to the Seychelles, for example, um, what are the right islands to visit. So people, especially in that consideration phase, really are looking for um, you know, peer reviews and am I making the right decision? And also towards the, uh, the purchase phase of the buying decision, 
Um, video also plays an important part because 25% of us, when we're actually given two similar destinations and a holiday um, options, would actually like to see branded video to, to help inform that decision. So social really is the constant in the, uh, the, the path to purchase and travel buying. Um, and really what's, what's going to be of interest is that 48% um, of people actually follow brands online and they follow, we're going to talk about Facebook here in particular, um, because that's where we spend about 55 minutes of our day and that's where the greatest number of users are. But about half of us actually follow travel brands because they want to be kept up to date with offers, inspiration uh, and announcements from brands. But the problem that we've seen since 2014 uh, is that Facebook has actually been changing the algorithm and brands are somewhat held to ransom on this. Facebook was actually struggling because people stopped sharing their personal posts and information as they did before, which actually showed that there was lower user activity on the network. So Facebook has actually changed the alg algorithm to show your memories, something that you may see every time that you log into Facebook these days. They're trying to encourage people to post and share content more instead of just consuming it. Now for brands, that's really meant that there's been a sharp decline, about 60% decline in the brand reach um, of any of your Facebook posts. Meaning that if you do a text, image, video post, um, at best you're looking to get between sort of 6 to 10% of your audience actually being able to see those. So that's a huge problem for brands. And uh, video is something that, again, we'll see with the algorithm changing, something that we can actually exploit to be able to reach more people. Um, now, I love this image, of course, because you can see the Zuckbucks. But uh, Mark Zuckerberg in April of this year actually came out and said, um, that in the next five years, he sees that video is going to be the main form of content across the network and the things that people are sharing the most as well. So when we think about the future of travel marketing trends and how we're going to be developing our strategies for the coming year, we really need to take video seriously because Facebook definitely is. And the reason that Facebook is facing, taking this seriously isn't just because video is a really engaging format. Again, it's something that we prefer to use when we're on our mobile devices. When we're, when we're on our handheld devices. But actually, Facebook is really going to battle, as is Twitter and the others, really going, battle, going to battle uh, with YouTube. Um, they've seen ballooning revenues from YouTube up to uh, $9 billion this year. And to put that into context, that is more ad revenue than all of the social networks combined. So not only has Facebook actually realized that, you know, that video is the future of the network, but they've also realized that it is the ultimate ad unit that's going to boost their revenues and their share price in the long run, which is something that we should really note and take very seriously. Um, so finally, what they're actually doing now is let's work with the algorithm, let's play Facebook's game, and the way that they're going to be able to take on YouTube is to actually be able to acquire more unique content uploaded natively to the Facebook platform. Um, they've already put out a number of... Uh, debated numbers about their views. They're saying they've got about 8, about 8 billion daily views uh, on Facebook at the moment. Um, and that's something that they're really going to be um, pushing going forward. So Facebook is giving 10 times greater reach to, to videos that are uploaded natively to Facebook as opposed to YouTube. Uh, and that means that also you're going to be reaching more of your audience, but also year on year, people are sharing 75% more video content. So this compounds that as well. The more video you get to share, the more of your audience will see it, and the more that they're likely to share to, again, grow your influence. And finally, Facebook Live is something that they're pushing incredibly hard. They're even taking out TV adverts, which is something that shows that, again, they're very serious about it. Um, but it is the ultimate content on the network. We are live at the moment ourselves on Flagship Consulting. Um, and really what brands can do once they go live is... Your audiences are notified, so again, they'll, they'll know that you're going live and they'll be able to tune into the broadcast. Um, they found that people watch uh, live broadcasts three times longer simply because it's more engaging, people are part of a moment, they're able to interact in real time, and this leads to also ten times the amount of engagement and comments um, on live posts as well. So ultimately, we need to really think about these in our strategies as we go forward, how we can actually bring these into a marketing mix um, in the coming years. And really, I suppose the advice that I give you is you need to be where your audiences are. That may not be Facebook necessarily. However, that's where the greatest benefits of, of reach and incentives from the networks is coming. Um, so what I'd advise is that you actually think about Facebook first, upload there, and then again, disseminate that across your other social channels. And I think the best kind of uh, analogy that I've heard recently for travel marketers when they're utilizing social media and video content is to actually think like a, a featherweight boxer in that you need to know your customer, you need to know their behaviors, 
Uh, you need to know their likes and, what, and, and how, they would, uh, how they behave. Uh, and then what you want to do is just do lots of little jabs, lots of light content throughout their experience as they're going through the network and the buying, the buying channel to be ready to actually have a commercial offer and a haymaker to finish it all off at the end. Um, so that's us. Please do um, get in touch at uh, message me on Twitter. I'd be happy to answer any questions you do have. Uh, and also get in to, to win a free bottle of bubbly. Thank you very much. Can you all hear me? Okay, good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Good, awesome. So um, just to let you know, I like engagement. So I'm gonna ask you some questions. I am from New York, so I'm a little animated, so get a little used to that if you see me using my hands a little bit. So I'm gonna ask the room, I wanna poll the room to find out a little bit more about you. How many of you have heard of Periscope? Okay. Facebook Live, great. How many of you are using either one of them? Okay, okay, we gotta work on that a little bit. Okay, so um, I wanted to kind of get to know you first before I talk about me, because I think that's one of the things that you have to remember when you're thinking about, if you're thinking at all about live streaming, it's all about engagement. It's all about knowing who you're talking to, getting to know them before you talk about yourself. So that was just one of the techniques that I like to use whenever I do a live video. So that's my big face up there. My name is Tawana B. Smith, and I'm known on Periscope as Tawana B. Smith, as well as on Twitter and other um, social media platforms. I started off blogging in about 2008. My website, MomsGuideToTravel.com, focused on family travel as well as women's luxury group travel. And then I, the spinoff was MGT Travel Media, which was actually born out of some successes on Periscope that I will get into a little bit. Um, my background is actually on camera. I love the camera. I'm a little bit of a ham sometimes. You might have experienced that. But I uh, did off-Broadway for a while, and I also worked in LA doing some on-camera stuff. So when live video came about, I was really attracted to it because I tried YouTube, but being a mom, having two kids, I just didn't have enough time to do a lot of the post-production work that a really solid YouTube video deserves. So when Periscope came about, I kind of ignored Meerkat. When Periscope came about, I was really attracted to it. And I became really consistent in October. I actually remember the day, October 2nd, I joined a group of other women and we all decided that we would live broadcast every single day in October. It was a challenge. And what that challenge did was it got us accustomed to getting on the camera every single day and talking to an audience. It allowed us to support one another. It allowed us to think about our content beforehand, to plan our content. And it also allowed us to support one another, which made our audiences grow much faster. So these are some of my successes with Periscope live streaming. Now, um, I'll get into Facebook Live in, in a second, but Periscope is my first love because it was available to me before Facebook. Facebook didn't make it available to the average user until this year, but Periscope was easy. I could pick up my phone, I could turn on the broadcast, and I could talk about what it was that I was doing. I decided to use it as a complement to my travel content. So showing people where I was going, talking about whatever blog posts I had, giving people travel tips. But then when I realized, when people started asking me questions about my products and started asking me questions about the things that I know how to do, I realized that there was an opportunity for me to work with people on a B2C level. I had only worked with brands, working on campaigns and sponsored posts and you know, any of these you know, press trips. But then when users, average everyday users, were asking me, well, how do I start blogging? How do I use Twitter? Like all of the things that a lot of us in here would think were basic, and then they were, wanted to pay me for it. I was like, oh yeah, of course, why not? So I, 
sold some ebooks, uh, ebooks that I had about live streaming. I also had a uh, book that I wrote about saving money on family travel that I was able to sell using Periscope. Affiliate sales for other products, whether it was mounts or other people's digital products. I also uh, put together a group trip that I was taking to Costa Rica, and I was casually talking about this group trip that, you know, stressfully I was planning. And then a few women asked, well, how can I find out more information about this trip? So I was always on there kind of talking about Costa Rica casually. And then when I realized that I could actually fill this trip by telling people what I was doing, where I was going, uh, answering any of the questions that I, you know, that they had, I saw that as an opportunity and, a, and was a, um, actually able to bring in two people on that small group trip. And then also my consulting services and then a digital marketing course that I sold on Periscope. So the main thing to remember is that, you know, you're using, I use the live streaming platform initially just to get on, just to have fun, but then when I realized that I actually could have a purpose for it and that I could convert people on the back end, then I had a strategy. So initially you might not have a strategy, but you can develop a strategy once you really think about what it is that you can offer people. The live streaming platform for me is just the first initial point of us getting to know each other. I'm always looking to convert them. So that means send them to a landing page, getting their emails or getting them to buy something from me. So that's how I approach live streaming. Um, so why now? We've already, we've already heard about this quick, this very fast changing digital environment. And in 2017, that by 2017, Ustream reports that 80% of the world data is going to be video. And live video is just a derivative of that. If you look at any of your friends, if you look at your stream, you'll see a lot more people are deciding to go live. Now, Periscope has taken a little bit of a, a back step to Facebook just because Facebook has put so much money into developing their live streaming platform. Periscope is my first love. One, because I, it was available to me first, but I like that it's in-app. And so with Facebook, there's just so much distraction, at, whereas Periscope, it's contained. So I do, when I do go live, you know, it's just a habit for me to pick up Facebook first, but I have started transitioning to doing live videos within my Periscope, within my Facebook page, as well as my groups. And then lastly, in a 2015 web video marketing study, 73% of the respondents reported that video had a positive impact on their marketing. And that's because if we think about marketing, marketing is all about people getting to know, like, and trust us. When you think of live video, that's pretty much the fastest path for people to be able to do that. They can get on, they can ask you questions, you present whatever your product or your service is to them. It's just a faster point, whereas if you're doing content, it takes them a little bit more time, a few more touch points before you can actually get them to take an action, whether that's to buy or to sign up for your email list. So I've already mentioned the leading platforms, Periscope, Facebook, YouTube Live I'm not really going to talk about because I don't have as much experience with it. But then there are all of these other niche live streaming platforms. So if you're into doing music, uh, Busker is a platform and people actually tip the live streamers. They give them money uh, when they do decide to go on Busker and play their music. Uh, that, so that's a fun app. Twitch, some of you may have heard of, gamers like that for live streaming. My son wants to do it. I'm still thinking about it, musical.ly, and about a dozen other platforms. So if I were to ask a question, and this is for a prize, so you have to raise your hand and stand up, where should you head your bets? Okay, here you go. Oh, no, you can't have that one. <laughs> I have a, oh, here you go. So he said Facebook. No, this is my personal, <laughs> I can't give you that one. Facebook, exactly. That is where you should head your bets. Just because, and we've heard about Facebook a little bit. So the great thing about Facebook Live video is even if you start your live stream and nobody's on your live stream, don't get upset, don't start crying. You can always get people to view your videos on the back end. So you can do it organically or you can boost that post. What we've seen with Facebook marketing is that live video, so Facebook is rewarding marketers when they're using live video for their ads, where people are paying one cent 
one cent for a lead. So that's something to think about, those of you who are thinking about using Facebook Live for your advertising. I'm gonna do a quick speed tutorial because it's really difficult to get into this in a short time period. Okay, so here it is. To get started, first start watching other people. Watch other people's broadcasts so that you can get an idea of what to do and what not to do. Be consistent to build your audience. That doesn't mean you have to be crazy like me and live stream every single day, but let them know what day and time you're going to live stream. Make sure that you're cross-promoting it on other platforms. So wherever you have a community, that is where you want to live stream. So if you have a community on Facebook, just go straight to Facebook and start live streaming. But let people know on Twitter, let people know in your newsletter, let people know in your feed what day and what time you're gonna live stream. Make sure that you have some basic equipment, obviously your phone, but get some sort of stand here, okay? We don't wanna deal with vertigo because you've got shaky hand syndrome. Make sure you have some sort of stand or a tripod or a selfie stick. Uh, engage with your audience the way I engage with you at the beginning. Ask them questions. It, let them, you know, get to know something about them before you start talking about yourself. And then auto-save your video so that you can repurpose that content later. Could totally talk about repurposing for 30 minutes, but I don't have that time. And then um, mostly have fun. Have fun with it and then have a strategy for it. All right. Thank you. Hello everyone. So I have to give this a minute to load, so I'm going to take this minute to tell you all about myself. Oh, I've come forward. My logo was before then. Um, my name is Neve Shields. Um, it's spelled in the Irish way, the only way to spell it. All of you are looking at it going, I don't know what that is. You don't need to know, don't worry about it. So I've been a blogger since 2007. My background before that is in technology. I've got a degree in physiology and a master's in multimedia technology. So I've always been in the geekery right since the early days of Atari. I've been there. So I'm an early adopter and I'm a little bit obsessive. So when I see something new coming in, I want to understand it. I want to see how it works. And I'm a full-time food writer and food and travel blogger now as well. So I'm talking about Snapchat, but actually it's not just Snapchat because what Snapchat has done is changed the game. Snapchat has made a new way of doing video easy and available to everyone. It's super immersive. It launched only five years ago in September 2011. And if you think of the influence it has now, how many of you use Snapchat? How many of you aren't bloggers? Okay, not so bad. So Snapchat measure in terms of daily active users, they have 150 million. This is more than Twitter. This is a lot more than Twitter. And over 50% of new Snapchat users are over the age of 25. So everyone thinks that it's a really young audience, it's all the kids, and yeah, they're all on there. But now us older folks are coming on too, and we're really appreciating the value of it as a platform. The average Snapchat user spends 30 minutes on there every day. They don't follow as many people as they do in other platforms because they might watch, say, three to five minutes of that person. The people who follow on Snapchat are really dedicated to the people they follow. It's really immersive, they like following their lives, they want to know everything about them. And I know that sounds strange, but actually it's awesome and it really works. And 25% of UK smartphone users use Snapchat. And when you consider that almost everyone has a, uh, has a smartphone, that's a huge amount of people. Snapchat's engagement is on a par with Facebook. That is amazing when you think that Facebook has 15 times more users, but Snapchat has the same engagement. Snapchat doesn't tell anybody how many followers they have. I don't know. All I see are the amount of people who view my snaps. That's it. It's really refreshing for people. I, I asked people who follow me, what do you like about Snapchat? And they were like, well, it's not about chasing for likes. It's just about being interested in something. Nobody knows how many followers anyone has. And they really like that. They find the people they like, and then they unfollow them, and they don't like them anymore. But you know. Uh, Snapchat also has more users than Pinterest or Twitter or LinkedIn. So like I said, it's all about engagement. Uh, users don't know how many followers they have. You can only see how many people watch it. There's a little eye at the side with numbers. And the Snapchat score is very confusing. So under your ghost, there's a fantastic number that's usually really high. All that means is how many messages you've sent and received. So if you're really active on there, your number is high. 
but it doesn't tell you anything about the amount of people watching. So my story is the thing you need to think about, and this is where everyone else is looking now, not just Snapchat. Facebook are looking at it, WhatsApp are looking at it, Instagram launched, Instagram stories. It is the My Story thing, which is a 24-hour rolling video. It falls off, and everyone is worried about that, but you don't need to be, because you can save it and use it somewhere else. This moved the platform from the personal messaging service, so everyone knows about how it was being used in the early days. Uh, so now it's all about a broadcasting platform as well as that private messaging platform. And this year they recorded 10 billion daily video, video views on Snapchat. That's quite amazing. And now everyone wants to be Snapchat, right? So I'm sure most people in the room here know about Instagram stories. Uh, my feeling is it's, it's not there. Maybe they'll improve it and it will be there. But the Instagram community want photos and now they've got everyone talking to them and they're like, what is this? This was a nice quiet room before and now everyone's talking to me. Periscope has added selfie masks, which are the filters. It's still a streaming platform. Facebook Messenger are testing a stories platform. Now that's super interesting. It's called Messenger Day, the exact same format, 24 hour story. And WhatsApp, this information I just found yesterday on TechCrunch, WhatsApp are testing a clone of Snapchat stories called Status. And how many people are on WhatsApp? So really what this is about is this 24-hour story loop is going to be a huge part of our lives, whether it's in Snapchat or wherever else we're using it. And you can't ignore it. It's not just for kids. Like I said, Snapchat continues to add users in all age brackets. The 25 to 34 and the 35 to 44 groups are now growing at the fastest rate. When I asked my followers what they liked about uh, Snapchat, actually a lot of people who got back to me were, you know, they're not kids. One lady was like, oh, I follow you because I'm a grandmother and I'm at home looking after my grandson. It's just great to see what's going on and what I can do and, you know, all that kind of stuff. So that's awesome. The content disappears. The content disappears. Don't obsess about the content disappearing. That's why everyone comes back. Remember when you could not record a TV show and you just watched it, right? Not that long ago. So users always come back because they know it's going to be gone. If you're new on Snapchat, Snapchat tips for me is it's a new way of using your phone, so it's counterintuitive. You swipe up, down, and across both ways. It's actually super simple, but you just need to give it a try. And not like I know a lot of people have opened it and gone, ah, and closed it again. Don't do that. It's easy. Talk to camera, go easy on the monologues. I do too many monologues. I know this, I'm trying to cut them down. But like, you know, it's really important to talk to people. People are following you because you are on there. If you're just going, oh, here's this uh, bowl of soup I had today, a really bad photo of a bowl of soup, well, why would anyone follow you? Uh, mix stills with video, but stills, that's Instagram, right? That's old school, so uh, keep it, keep it, you know, you can do a pouring shot, whatever it is you're doing. I do food and travel, so it's everything around there. Um, use the filters. The filters are fun, right? You can be a rabbit, a raccoon, whatever you want, but also you can say, I'm in London, it's 16 degrees, I'm at this altitude because I'm on the cable car. You know, you can do lots of fun things. You can speed it up and slow it down. And, you know, think of it always as a story and edit it. We're all actually natural editors because we were watching TV for years. So we understand how editing works and just think of, like, how can I make this better, snappier? You have 10 seconds, don't always use 10. 10 seconds is a long time in the world of video. Maybe you just need to use three. And you can create filters for your own brand or your destination. So you can have a world travel market filter. You create your filter and you send it to Snapchat for approval. It has a cost, but actually it's not anywhere near what you'd expect it to be. Um, really smart events are, have Snapchat filters. And then I just had to put up a GIF of a cat snapping. But I think you should all give it a go. I think Snapchat and, and this daily story concept, it's where we're all going to be ne from next year and the year after. It's, it's where it's all going. Everyone wants part of the action. So thank you. OK, big thanks to, um, to all three speakers for the great, three great presentations. We do want to um, have about 15 minutes or so to do some some questions and answers. So if anyone's got a question, just stick your hand up. I am behind the lights here, so it's not the easiest thing to see, but I think Mr. Ferugia down here has a, a question. I don't know your, your names. <laughs> um, so we have really embraced Facebook Live, but one of the big problems is when you're in locations like we go to, 3G doesn't exist, 4G definitely doesn't exist, and Wi-Fi is very intermittent. So what do you do then? 
Is it on? Yeah. I, Can you hear me? Can you hear me? No. Oh, I have to get up? No, you oh, no. Oh, there you go. Okay. Good. No, um, so that was one of my concerns coming here because um, I have an iPhone. I'm on Sprint. They're really crabby. So there is, um, there's a company called TEP. And my girlfriend, uh, Natasha, I'm going to put you on blast, she told me about it. And I get it right at the airport so I can travel with the Wi-Fi device for me. So I think, you know, from a business perspective, if you're on location because you're doing something for a brand or a destination, I think it is in your best interest to price that into your cost to get some sort of local uh, Wi-Fi device. Can I just um to button very quickly? Um, Tep Wireless also love working with influencers. So if any of you do want to meet with them um, or speak to them, give me your card and I can introduce you to them. They've sponsored a few of our events before, so yep. they're very good to use. Does anybody else have any points to add to that? I think that's a pretty good uh, response. I'd say that you can also uh, go into a hard line with an Ethernet to uh, iPhone connection as well, which is probably the simplest way of going direct to the, to the source. But yeah, I'd say that you should invest in uh, local. <laughs> Okay, perfect. Um, any other questions? Um, yep. Julie? Thanks. <laughs> I have a question about Snapchat, so Neve might be the one to, to answer yeah. it. But what do you think are the implications of Instagram stories for Snapchat, especially when we deal with it in blogging and travel? I even anecdotally talked to a few bloggers at Traverse Mingle on Friday night who either said they've stopped using Snapchat altogether since Instagram launched stories or that their engagement has really fallen. So is it something we should still be trying to do both or should we play it differently? Um, so yes, that's a really good question. I think you can hear me. Uh, so yes, Instagram stories was rolled out. A lot of people had a lot more followers on Instagram, so they moved across, but a lot of them came back and curiously, they all came back the same day. It was like there was something in the ether. All of a sudden, I saw all these people going, oh, and what should I, ooh. Anyway, <laughs> so um, I believe that uh, Instagram, the Instagram audience don't want the volume of video content that the Snapchat audience wants. When I do Instagram stories, I make sure it's different content, but I only do max like three, uh, vid three 10 second things, because people, I don't think want it. You know, the views are, were high when people were curious, but I've also heard lots of anecdotal stories of people unfollowing people because they didn't like their video content and they did like their photos. So I think it's all to play for. The problem with Snapchat is uh, the search functionality doesn't work very well, but they have just bought a really smart search uh, startup. So I think watch Snapchat. I think they're the ones to, that's the horse to back. Yeah. Great, thank you. We have had some questions come in um, over the app while, we, while we've been doing this, so I'm just gonna, uh, gonna put one to um, Tawana, which is, uh, how would you avoid looking like an amateur uh, on oh. Facebook Live? But I guess that, that can be for any of you on, on all three of the platforms that we spoke about today. I love that question. That's such an awesome question. So, um, yeah, well, <laughs> you really have to practice. And this might sound silly, but, you know, when you're live streaming, you're, you're talking to people. I think you should learn how to talk to yourself first. When I, when I speak to people and they tell me about their inhibitions with getting on the camera, they say that they don't like looking at themselves. They're nervous looking at themselves on the camera. So. You know, in the acting world, we really did a lot of our work in the mirror, so talking to ourselves in the mirror. Whenever you're gonna do a presentation, one of the suggestions is to know your first line of what you're gonna say before you start going into a presentation. So there's some little, little tips, little things that you can do, but really look at what other people are doing and take some notes. Uh, what are they doing well? Uh, what do you think they're not doing well? But the best way to not be an amateur is to do whatever it is that you want to do. Just do it. Sorry, that was cliche, but That's yeah. Right. Anything to add to that, Neve? Um, well, my perspective is uh, don't be afraid to look like an amateur. You know, there's nothing wrong with it. It's actually super refreshing. People are sick of everything being really polished. And you will get better as you, you know, get more experience. So just be an amateur. When you're an amateur, there'll only be about 10 people watching anyway. So don't stress. I would say our next uh, session, which is happening straight after this one, is all about YouTube, and I'm sure this question will pop up again uh, to do with that platform, so we'll try and cover that. Um, Kevin, one for you, which was, um, as, a, as a brand uh, or an agency or a destination, how do you look for people to work with when it comes to live streaming? So would you find an influencers um, for this side? 
So I think it's really sort of back to basics and the things that everyone needs to be doing when they're putting together their, their strategies. Um, in terms of you know, doing the planning, it really needs to be benchmarking. You need to look at your audiences, find out what are the things that are already engaging with them, what are they sharing, what are your competitors doing well. Even look across to, uh, to other industries that are doing this, this even better. And I think kind of reverse engineering is first of all give you the confidence to be able to, to go out and start doing creative things that you know will have impact. But again, it's, it's not for the sake of going out there and doing things. You want to make sure that what you're going to do is going to resonate. Um, and that really is, is the planning, the storyboarding. Again, not necessarily looking amateurish. Um, and, and that's really what goes into being able to kind of develop these strategies. Thank you. And so just for Neve, um, how would you uh, pitch to a brand or a destination um, that you are working on Snapchat? Well, I think uh, as you've always done, you know, like engage with the person directly and do it in a friendly way, know their stuff, know what they do make sure it's the kind of thing they would cover. I mean, I know Snapchat is a bit more difficult because even finding people can be hard, but just, you know, ask around, see who people are watching, see what's a good fit for you, do you like how they present, and then reach out to them. You know, most people are open to an approach, and the worst thing that will happen is that they're not into it, you know? Okay, great. I think we've got time for just one more question. Um, so we'll take one from the audience, if there is one out there. We do. A man standing up at the back. Hi, uh, my name is Kerwin McKenzie. Um, I have a blog at pastrather.com. And um, my question for the group is, so it's great to have all the live streaming stuff, but how do you suggest like, getting that custom information so you can actually market to them after the live stream? Absolutely, so uh, as I was mentioning earlier, I'm always, numbers are just numbers, okay? It's just vanity. They mean nothing to me if the person does not take an action that I want them to take. So I'm always thinking about it from a marketer's perspective. I'm always thinking about, you know, how can I service the brand, whoever's hired me to do whatever it is they want me to do. Influence is actually when people do something that you tell them to do. It's not just about the numbers. So I do really ask people, hey, listen, go to this landing page or follow me here, but go to this landing page and sign up for whatever it is that I have, that I want them to sign up, because it is important for me to build my email list. It's important for me to be able to talk to them off of the platform. The platform is really just like the cocktail party. It's the, the cold, uh, cold market. We're warming up when I get you onto my email list and then I can email you at another time because live streaming is just it's subjective. You might not be free when I'm live streaming, right? But I can maybe email you to tell you, oh, I'm going to be on on Friday at 2 p.m. Can you tune in? Or I'm doing this next week or I have this product to sell. So always be thinking about one. I'm always thinking about holding on to my content, because I don't own any of these platforms. So I'm always auto-saving my videos and making sure that I can possibly repurpose it in another way. And I'm also making sure that I'm leading people to a landing page so that I can capture their email and have a conversation with them, a deeper conversation with them later. Thanks. Can we just get one very quick point from um, Kevin and Neve on this one? Yeah, I think it's using the kind of data you have, so looking at your own analytics. Uh, and then again, benchmarking against the competitors, um, what's working well, uh, and ultimately kind of split testing two things. You're going to be doing a lot of sort of destination content itself. You know, so try new things, see what resonates, uh, and continually improve upon what you're doing. But never ignore your own data and what's working out uh, well in the market. Okay. Uh, I think if I understood the question, it's just like, actually in Snapchat it's a lot softer. It's all about just being yourself and uh, then getting that natural engagement. I get a lot of messages from people. For example, when I went to Budapest in the summer and the week I went, three people messaged me on Snapchat and said they'd booked flights as a result of the coverage, that they thought it was a very exciting city and could they have the restaurant list. And that kind of stuff, you know, because... I actually wasn't there with the tourist board, I was just there independently. And so I get a lot of feedback naturally, that's the way Snapchat is. People on Snapchat want to talk to the people they're following, so you get it automatically. Yeah. Okay. Um, so once again, thanks so much um, to, to all three of you. Uh, just um, a quick bit of information about, uh, about the sessions. All, um, all three sessions we will be making available online. Uh, we will do an email out to everybody who attends these to let you know when that's uh, possible to download those. Um, and how to access them. If there's um, anything specific you want to ask any of us, just feel free to come and give us your cards or, or ask now. Um, for a very quick plug for something we're doing, we're running um, our biggest uh, 
blogger influencer event we've ever done in London next April. Uh, we've decided um, to reflect kind of the way things are going with video and live that um, at least 30% of the content we're covering is going to be looking at um, video. So it'll be mobile, live and stuff like that. So if you want to have a lot more sessions like this and in-depth talks and masterclass and one-on-ones, you can grab a very cheap ticket now. Um, that's about it for us now. We've got a YouTube session coming up in about five minutes with some more great speakers and another panel. So hopefully you stick around then. If not, um, if not we've got two more tomorrow, two more on Wednesday. Um, and if you want to quickly run out to Lua, grab a drink or something, about five minutes, we're going to be starting the next session. Thank you all.